Welcome filmmakers, fans, and friends to Indie Cinema Showcase. I'm your host, John Thiessen. Each episode, my co-host Tim Anderson and I will be here to bring you the best and brightest in local independent cinema. Each show will highlight a specific aspect of independent filmmaking, be that an actual genre, role of key certain crew members, or various outlets or resources for filmmakers to utilize in their productions. We will then discuss the ins and outs of these topics with our industry guests, while also spotlighting some Florida-made films that are great examples of the subject matter. Today's show topic will be focused on the role of the film critic and their place in the world of movie magic. Later in the program, we'll be joined by Roger Moore, longtime film critic for the Orlando Sentinel. All right, gang, let's get things rolling with a very unique short film about a boy who wants to go outside, but whose mother won't let him. The film is entitled Out and was directed by local film student Nils Terringer. Thank <laughs> you. 
Once again, that was Out, directed by Nils Terringer. Now, each show we like to give our own thoughts from a popcorn gallery and offer feedback about the films we showcase so we can give our audiences something to disagree with. So, John, what would you think of Out? I thought Out was uh, a very whimsical film. I mean, it was, uh, I mean, such a, a simple film in, in a lot of respects. I mean, in one major location, yeah. uh, a simple kind of subject matter. But the fact that it was a silent film, it was shot beautifully. And I think this film in itself is a great example of what we're trying to showcase on the show today, being a film critic and, and not always agreeing. Yeah. I'm sure there's some audience members at home that loved this film and it was the best thing they had seen, and some people that just absolutely hated it. And, and so I think this film is a great one to showcase because I think it brings up a dialogue for people to talk about. See, I think I, I'm going to disagree maybe with you, even just your choice of words. Perfect. I don't think that I would call it whimsical. I, I think it was this dark, kind of austere Kubrickian film this sure. really antiseptic and disturbing movie about maybe the, maybe the film takes place inside someone's mind mm. i mean i love that it's completely open for interpretation sure. but what i kind of took out of it and you know like i said you know movies completely open for interpretation in any way you want to look at it because it doesn't have any specific signs pointing you in a direction mm -hmm. but i like the idea of almost this person trapped inside their own brain maybe they're institutionalized mm -hmm. and they're trying to get past the hurdle to get out the door because when you get out the door there's nothing it's sure. just white light i mean it could be a metaphor for death they could be in a, a coma in a hospital room and sure. they finally passed on it's just it's a beautifully made movie to discover more about the film you just saw or to find out what other projects Nils is working on, you can email him at ndog2 at gmail.com or visit his YouTube site at youtube.com front slash ndog2. Well, when we come back from the break, we'll be talking with Orlando Sentinel film critic Roger Moore. Stick around. Welcome back. Now, since on ICS we want to do more than just show fancy moving pictures to our audiences, on this episode's Industry Insight segment, we're very excited to have with us a guy who is never short on opinions, Orlando Sentinel film critic Roger Moore. Thanks for being here, Roger. It's a pleasure. Well, uh, to kick things off, Roger, how did you get your start as a film critic? Well, I started reviewing movies when I was in college uh, for the public radio station where I worked there in, in Virginia. And as I worked in public radio for a few years right out of college, I continued to do it. And at one point, I was at a city where there was a newspaper that happened to have an opening. Oh, wow. And so I started doing it part-time there. That was in North Dakota, of all places. It was a very good place for a movie critic because the long winters sent people to movie theaters. Yeah. We had, at that time, the city I was living in had the highest concentration of movie theaters per capita in the country. Oh, that's so nice. it was weird. I mean, you, and it, you, you, it was an audience that cared enough to write letters before the internet, and uh, you sort of learned learn the craft there. So you didn't start out wanting to be a writer, per se. You just kind of fell in through the film? Um, I started out wanting to do the, the broadcast thing, and then I realized the writing thing was more interesting. So I was in grad school at the time that I made the jump and uh, studying criticism, which is a discipline of English. Sure. Yeah. And getting an English graduate degree and, uh, and trying to do that, and, and that, in that, that way, I sort of 
sort of leveraged it into the movie reviewing. Great. Was the focus always going to be movies? I mean, has it always been movies with you, or did, did you fall into it a little bit more? Well, there's a lot of journalism to it. I mean, I, you know, one of the reasons I'm still employed and a whole lot of movie critics aren't is I started out as a reporter. Yeah. So I do a lot of interviewing. I do a lot of profiles of people who make movies, uh, filmmakers and uh, the actors and actresses, screenwriters, virtually everybody involved in the business. I sure. cover the business here in town, keep an eye on it. You know, something like a Star Wars convention happens in Orlando, yeah. a huge Star Wars convention. I covered that all weekend. Okay. Uh, so you know, when, you've got to be able to, to to leverage what you what they want from you with what you want to do. Sure. Yeah. And uh, a whole lot of people don't get that or, or have not been as quick to get that. And I think that's one of the ways that I've been able to stick around. Well, I think uh, we've all heard the term. Uh, well, Tim and I went to school for cinema studies and trying to be the film critic role as well. But you hear the term "everybody's a critic." Do you feel that? Everybody's a critic, or is there a certain schooling or certain knowledge you need to become a, a an actual film critic? Well, everybody is a critic. You know, you just, yeah. all you have to do is, is go to a movie and walk out and listen to what people say. I mean, that's that's what they do. The difference between what I do and what the average member of the public does is that they choose to go see something that they think they're going to like. Yeah. I see everything, mm. so I'm going in a little bit more uh, with a little, little bit more of a, pers a different perspective and a broader perspective, and and I'm giving I'm applying different criteria to it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think at some point you've uh, the, I separate critics between uh, critics and wannabes with just one thing: Do you take notes? Yeah. If you don't take notes, if you don't, if you're not listening to the way the movie's written, if you're not noticing the way the action is un unfolding, and then picking out key moments without giving away spoilers and, and writing that down and not just relying on your memory, you're not a professional, you're not doing what I'm doing. Mm, yeah. Okay. With the newspapers and, and, and the printed word kind of on decline, um, I mean, what do you feel like the future role is of, of the critic, say, in the internet? People seem to be using aggregators a lot more these days. That, that yeah. is a, a sort of a, a mean opinion, a whole lot of opinions measured out uh, by graphs on things like Rotten Tomatoes or Metacritic, which is a little bit better because yeah. they actually pay attention to what you actually said as opposed to just saying you liked it, you didn't like it's it. It's not as broad either. Yeah, right? yeah, and, uh, and uh, Movie Review Intelligence is another yeah. online website. And because people are using uh, the Internet a lot more for criticism, using it as, as a mobile app on their phone or whatever to make their decision when they go out that night or that afternoon or whenever. Uh, it's it's kind of gone that way. And you kind of see if you're not on Rotten Tomatoes, you're not on all these different sites, you're, you're not part of the conversation. And that's kind of where it's all gone. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. I mean, do you think that oversaturation, though, I mean, it's almost... So many people putting their name in the hat, being a critic. You know, how do you? How would you suggest somebody whittles their way through to find? It's very difficult. The, the, the way you get into Rotten Tomatoes, for instance, is you get into a critic society, like yeah. uh, the online critic society. Uh, a lot of people are doing it that way. The, the, these people are self-published, so you could make the joke that that you get what you pay for, and they're not mm -hmm. being paid to give their opinions. But sure. the other side of it is, uh, if they get into a group and the group acknowledges their presence and the group has some sort of standards, then yeah. it's a good thing. I'm mm. in the Florida Critics Circle, there's the National Society of Film Critics, all these different yeah. groups around the country that, that sort of uh, give you professional standards and, and kind of winnow the, the field a little bit, as it were, and, and not only people who are just putting their opinions up of, of a movie on Facebook. Sure. Yeah. Well, well, Roger, since you watch so many films a year, you know, what common mistakes do you see you know, filmmakers make over and over again? Boy, that's a hard one. Um, you know, you know, you used to say, well, shooting on film. Well, it, that's not the case anymore. I mean, mm. people don't need to do that. Sure. And, and, you, and you hear things about, uh, you know, Robert Rodriguez's famous book about how to make movies really, really cheap yeah. is, is, is still kind of a gold standard there. But it's very difficult to sort of generalize. Everybody makes, you know, a different sort of movie. I think one of the, one of the, uh, one of the problems people make is to, is to sort of narrow their focus to just one genre and desperately try to make their breakthrough in that one genre. Yeah. You see, way too many people trying to make movies in horror. Yeah. I mean, and they want to break through. And, and horror is a big genre, but it's not that big. I mean, a horror movie sure. typically will open at 15 to 20 million dollars. And if it's a real big name director like Wes Craven, 22 million dollars. Yeah. And then it will make 50 million dollars and 60 million dollars. Yeah, and there are thousands of people out there trying to make movies in this one genre. Sure. You, you need to pay attention to what other people are doing. I think that's one thing people notice. I mean, look at what's not actually, uh, what's, what's not, what Hollywood's not actually doing well. And one of the things Hollywood hasn't done very well in the last five years is romantic comedies. Sure. Yeah. So um, this, this guy from Tal uh, Gainesville, a uh, UF student who did this movie, uh, uh, New Low, which was at the Florida Film Festival. Just romantic, mm. slacker, comedy, mm. uh, droll dialogue, 
believable people, uh, a sort of a real clash of, uh, of, of two personalities when he meets a woman. Uh, that, that's a real interesting idea, you know, that Hollywood hasn't been able to do much with. And the best romantic comedies I've seen in the last four or five years have been indie films that, you know, black and white. Sure. And, 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 you know, these movies got out there and the person got a name. We'll bring it back to local filmmakers um, trying to get uh, your attention. Um, do you accept locally produced films for review? Um, if, it has to be something somebody's going to see somewhere. Okay. So is it on YouTube? Well, that's kind of below the radar. Yeah. If it's made it into a festival. We try to make, because there are 12, 15,000 film students here in town, mm -hmm. uh, you've got to have some hoop that they jump through before they get to you. Yeah. So if your movie gets into a film festival, a, a horror movie like 222, mm -hmm. gets into a film festival, that's when I can start writing about it. Uh, the right. same is, is, is true if the movie gets distribution, if it's coming out on DVD, yeah. um, or if it's gotten, uh, you know, gotten wider distribution, you want to know about it. I don't. I like hearing about the movie, and I'll write at a certain level, like online only, mm -hmm. about the film as it's going into production. Yeah. And if you get a name in it, like an actor that people have heard of, mm -hmm. um, I'll go out and visit the set and write a little story about it. Okay. But the audience, uh, because there's so many people out there doing this, the, yeah. uh, the newspaper audience and the audience in, in, in Central Florida in general is just sort of could be saturated with this. I could do a story of those a day sure. yeah. and still leave dozens and dozens of people out any given year because a lot of little indie films are getting made. Yeah. Well, do you ever have somebody that comes to you and say, you know, Roger? Uh, I, I'm, I just want your advice, you know, or your feedback just from the feedback alone and not worried about if it gets to print or not, because obviously you have such a wealth of knowledge. You could probably help a lot of filmmakers in that respect. It's a, it's a, it's a question of physics, you know. I can't put more hours in the day. For instance, I'll be watching an entire film festival's movies over the course of a three or four day weekend. Yeah. And uh, for me to squeeze in time to go to, to see something or something like that, it, it's a little bit of a, of a special case. I mean, I'll have to, you know, I'll have to squeeze in the time because sure. I see a couple of movies a day, every day. And wow. then when film festival's coming up, and there are a lot of them here in Central Florida, yeah. uh, I'm seeing five, six, seven movies a day. Wow. And um, you know, you just, you've just got to physically be able to find a few hours uh, to, to be able to watch somebody's project, even sure. if it's just a short film. Sure. Well, bringing it back into film criticism, and, and, I, and really, I guess, to wrap it up, I mean, what advice would you have to someone today who wants to be a film critic? Who wants to be you, Roger, and take yeah. it seriously, you know? Yeah, it's, it's very difficult, because uh, the, the, the jobs in print journalism dried up and yeah. they're continuing to dry up. I mean, there, there was a, a, a weeding out a couple of years ago that pretty much half the people I know who do what I do were laid off and there are very few of us left. Yeah. But uh, so, so being able to make your living at it solely doing this is, is, is really circumscribed right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there's no, nothing to keep you from going and getting a job in a bookstore and going to every movie you can and yeah. getting, uh, you know, putting your reviews up online yourself and trying to work your way into a uh, critics organization of some sort or another and, and sort of work your way into it that way. Um, I'm not sure the path uh, is, is as clear cut as it was when I was starting out sure. in terms of your, your, your gig is to, is to figure out a paper that needs somebody mm. and to either do that as a freelancer for them or you know, just to let them try you out as a volunteer freebie. Uh, reviewer for a little while or whatever. The, the, those paths seem to be gone. You're, you're trying to do something now that's 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 going to be building your own audience online, and that is very very hard to do. Yeah. Once again, Roger, thank you so <laughs> much for being here with us today. Uh, you're a wealth of knowledge, and we always you know been a long time friend, and we appreciate you coming on with your busy schedule. My so. pleasure, guys. Yeah. To read Roger's film reviews, pick up an Orlando Sentinel or visit orlandosentinel.com. You can also follow Roger on his blog frankly, my dear, at the web address on your screen. As Roger heads back to blog about what a great time he had on our show, we're going to look at this episode's feature feature. This feature trailer is called Zellwood. Hope you enjoy.
Now, since we're not just here to listen to ourselves talk, we're going to try to impart some wisdom with our fun facts segment presented by GreenRoomOrlando.com. These facts are sent to us from the wild world of the Internet. This episode's question is from Sean. Dear ICS, I've been getting several rejections from film festivals lately, and I was wondering if there are any outlets where people would review my films and give me feedback before I spend the money to submit to festivals. I'm always hearing positive things from my friends and family, but I feel like I need a more honest and critical eye to give me feedback. What do you think, John? Well, um, I think Sean's point is, is perfect, what he's seeking out, because our friends and families, I mean, they're basically yes men and women, you know. They don't want to lie to you. It's that they can't see that you're untalented. Well, bottom line is your mother's always going to be stoked that you made a film and they're going to love whatever you do. <laughs> even, if, even if they hate it and they don't understand it, they're probably going to tell you how wonderful yeah. it is. God but I think her. to be a more critical filmmaker, and especially to start thinking about film festivals and these types of things, you have to look to get a more critical eye and basically a, a little bit better feedback. So I would say to Sean... You know, look to the people in your area. Uh, you know, if you're in a film school, you know, ask your film professors. You know, after class, walk up to them, you know, get their feedback. Obviously, we had Roger on. Roger said he does, it, when he finds time, will review a film. And mm -hmm. even guys like you and I, you know, we review films and, and, and uh, scripts yeah. and these things all the time. I mean, we do our best to fit it in our day. It's tough when somebody hands you a 90-page script and wants you to get them feedback two days later. But if they respect our time, I'll do my best to fit it in. And look, Sean, I mean... You can go on to the, there, there's lots of websites out there, especially for independent filmmakers, where you can network with people that are also, you know, your peers. And while I don't think that it's necessarily the smartest move to send your, your, your baby out into the broad world where it can be, you know, appropriated by anyone, sure. um, it is important maybe to go out there and make those kind of connections and see if there's people that are willing to trademark as well. And, and you should really make sure that you copyright your screenplay before you do that or register it with the WGA. Sure. When I used to also, you know, I think we're always looking to the people that are a few steps further down the path than we are. Yeah. So when I started making films, I looked to a guy that I respected in my community yeah. and I said, hey, you know, I really like your films. I like what you're doing. Would you mind giving it a once over? And then I think after you do that enough, maybe you'll get enough inherent knowledge that you don't need to do that as often. But at least when you're starting out, getting other critical eyes is very, very important. Yeah. If you'd like to be a part of our fun facts segment, you can submit your questions by visiting the ICS link on greenroomorlando.com. If you ask us a question that we can't answer, we'll Google it. Now, it's time for my favorite segment of the show, Films to See Before You Die. Now, are you looking for something a bit off the beaten track to check out late at night? Well, each episode, Tim and I pick a couple DVDs that just might have slipped past your radar, but films that we think you absolutely need to feast your eyes on. So, Tim, what do you have for us this week? Um, well, you know, we, you know, we like to try to, you know, tweak it a little bit towards who we're at. But for film criticism, I mean, really, you just should pick any movie that's good. Sure. And by default, a film to see before you die should be a great movie. So what I've picked is uh, Peter Weir's 1975 film, Picnic and Hanging Rock. Um, and Peter Weir went on to a hugely successful career, but this was really his breakout movie. I mean, he went on later and he directed Gallipoli and Dead Poet Society, Truman Show, uh, and Master and Commander mm -hmm. uh, with Russell Crowe. But um, this to me is this kind of like amazing sort of gothic Victorian, and I wouldn't call it a horror film as much as it's a mystery thriller about this group of schoolgirls who go to Hanging Rock in Australia and uh, they vanish. Completely. And one of the things that I think, besides the movie being this beautiful film and very atmospheric and very, very creepy, um, it's sort of one of those first movies, and I, Orson Welles did this earlier, sure. but sort of one of the first movies where everybody who saw it was convinced it was a true story mm. that had taken place in 1900 on Valentine's Day. These girls just vanished. And the filmmakers did very little to dispel the belief that this was a real event. Sure. Well, my film, uh, I would hope everybody had seen, but another critically acclaimed movie, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Milos Forman, uh, won Best Picture in 1975. So obviously it's critically acclaimed. Uh, I consider it to be Jack Nicholson's best movie. Absolutely. And I just really, really love this film. Uh, it's set in an asylum. It's got Danny DeVito, uh, all these other you know great actors that have gone on to much bigger uh, acclaim. But for me, uh, this is where it all started in a lot of respects. Jack Nicholson, I mean, has been trying to outdo this performance in everything he's done since then. Crazy Jack, well, there's nothing better than having Jack in an asylum. And Yeah, Jack Nuts is always great. So. Yeah, yeah, so this is the epitome of that. And uh, I would say this is definitely a film. If you haven't seen it, shame on you, but at least see it before you die. Absolutely.
Well, that's all, folks. Uh, we want to thank all of you out in TV land for joining us. We also want to thank Roger Moore for dropping by to share his insights with us, as well as always as our segment sponsors. We hope you learned something new, saw something you love, or got inspired to get off your couch and go make a movie of your own. Maybe it'll be good enough for us to show on the next Indie Cinema Showcase. But until then, we say to all you current and upcoming filmmakers, peace, love, and positive reviews. Until next time. That was good. Yeah.